Hi everyone, Victor O'Loughlin and Sartuk Pataneik here, representing Bank of New York Mellon's clearance and collateral management business. We're excited to present what we've learned from our journey in helping solve a key financial services challenge that has the potential to bring big time benefits to our clients and the US Treasury market as a whole, all realized by leveraging Google Cloud's powerful data science platform. As the global digital business leader for clearance and collateral management, leveraging data through analytics and machine learning is a key focus area for our business in order to enhance our ability to improve the client experience. Whether it's predicting a failed transaction or offering a prescriptive analytics solution to resolve it, our future is firmly planted in operating as a data first company. BNY Mellon has a long history of serving our clients. As a CIO of Clearance and Collateral, my responsibility is to focus on growing this business. But it is important for us to know how we got here and how the business grew to where it is today. It will share the importance of this exciting new service that we're building. It actually starts with the average investor who, for example, saves into a 401k. If the investor rebalances her 401k account, shifting from equities in favor of bonds then, her 401k administrator may get those bonds by contacting their trading desk, who in turn goes to the bond market and says, I'd like to buy treasury bond ABC for 95% of the face value. Buyer and seller named EB make their offers and a trade is arranged. The buyer and seller agree to swap the bond for cash and they notify a third party service provider of the agreement because they want that service provider to manage the actual exchange of bond for cash at the end of the day. The fund admin will agree to many such trades throughout the day. In most cases, that exchange is successfully completed, but sometimes it's not. A counterparty may not be able to deliver the bond due to some unforeseen event occurring after the agreement, but the investor still needs their bond. The fund admin keeps some extra on hand to make the investor whole in case of a settlement fail how many extra should the admin keep? Well, that depends on how often a settlement of failure occurs. If the admin knew that, they could right-size their stockpile and free up valuable cash. This cash could improve market liquidity by buying and selling more bonds or fund the development of new services for the investor. So, Predicting settlement fails is key, but that would require a total view of the market. The fund admin doesn't have that, but the clearing and settlement service does. BNY Mellon is that clearing and settlement service. Because we're in the center of the market, we have a total market view. And with that view, plus Google Cloud's powerful analytics, we can predict which trades will fail to settle allowing the admin to predict how many spare treasuries to keep on hand. Of course, BNY Mellon didn't begin in the cloud era. We had a 236 year head start. In 1784, we were founded by then US treasurer, Alexander Hamilton. Some of you may have seen the musical. In 1789, the first loan but to the US government was provided by BNYM in the form of a treasury security. Fast forward to today, and treasuries are the largest and most liquid fixed income market in the world. With BNY Mellon still deeply involved in this market, clearing and settling over 9 trillion in Fed eligible securities a day. Because of our important role in the financial markets, a core mission of our business is to invest in resiliency 
in value-added services that help create efficiency and stability. And helping solve the Fed eligible securities fails challenge is a prime example of that. So we kicked off of an investigation or what we call formed a hypothesis into how we might help predict these settlement fails. The fails vary from day to day, but generally they amount to one to 2% of approximately 4.5 trillion in security deliveries. This percentage seems like a small number and it is, but due to the sheer size of this market, it amounts to approximately 70 billion of settlement fails a day. Transactions that do not successfully settle by 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time each day are considered fails. So we aim to predict the fails at 1.15 p.m. each day, providing approximately two hours notice. Sartuk, can you tell us how we went about this? There are four stages to our machine learning process. Stage one is focused on data ingestion, where we built a data pipeline to move data from our on-prem transactional system to our on-prem data lake, all the way to Google Cloud Storage. In the second stage, we are focused on data preparation. The first part of it is ensuring good data quality controls. And the second part of it is feature engineering. In the feature engineering step, we start off with transactional information, things like account, security information, and transactional information. And then we iterate across a multi-functional group, try to get more information from the clients, from the business, from products, from developers, as well as from the data engineers. At the end of multiple iterations, we landed up with 51 variables. 44 of them were something that we identified as part of those iterations. And most of these variables were economic in nature. Things like demand supply variables, liquidity variables, and transaction velocity variables. The third stage is around model building. And when we are building the model, we were targeting three objective functions. One, accuracy. Second, performance. And third, interpretability. And we evaluated a whole plethora of models from simple regression to tree-based models, all the way to neural net. As we iterated over the models, we did finally settle with the light GBM model. And the reason for that is the balance between accuracy and interpretability. Our clients were very interested to use a model which provides them directionality as to why a transaction has a higher chance of failure than another transaction. The fourth stage is building the production pipeline. Once we built our model, which, which we train and test, having an automation to take the output of the model, the output coefficients into a production system and ensuring that that is seamless was critical for our success. Also important was the frequency as we retrained the model every three months, and also going through the model validation to ensure that the model did what it's supposed to do. What did we learn from this entire process? Three things. First is data culture. We are trying to transform ourselves from a transaction-based organization to a data-driven organization. And if you think about data, we think about the five Vs which is volume, velocity, variety, veracity, and value. Veracity was the most important concept for us because we wanted to build a solid data control process and solid quality controls upfront. The second thing we learned was around our transactional systems and storing everything. Traditional transaction systems, we focus a lot on storing our inputs, and then we have our algorithms and the, we store the outputs, which is used for client reporting or end of day regulatory reporting. 
But as a part of this process, we try to store information at every point in time during the algorithm for every decision point the algorithm took. As a result, we captured inordinate amount of risk, credit usage, inventory, position, and cash information. Because we do not know which of this data is going to be useful for our next experiment. Thirdly, we realized very quickly that the success of this project has to be a mix of expertise from the data engineers as well as the subject matter experts. As we were iterating, there were a couple of sprints where we had 95% plus accuracy. And when we went back and looked at it, we actually found that we are predicting the past. So that was an interesting thing that when your model is significantly good, go back and check your model. The second thing in this entire process that we learned was the concept of agility. This is a multifunctional team. And the goal of the team was to have small experiments in a piecemeal fashion and have a an hypothesis for each of them. And as we address, as we hit those hypotheses, we move forward or we go back and restart with our new sets of, sets of uh, hypotheses. So for that to happen, it is important that infrastructure is not your bottleneck and infrastructure is an enabler for that. And the third thing that we learned is digital transformation. This is not about technology. It's about people, process, and technology together. When we build machine learning projects, those are not deterministic. These are exploratory. These do not have a requirements document, a design, a development, and a testing process like a waterfall. You have to think about small experiments. You have to look at hypothesis, and you have to iterate. So fast iteration is key to our success. Now let's talk about results. Our target was to predict 40% of the fails with 80% precision. And happy to say that we are able to hit those objectives. Now I'll hand it over to Victor to talk about what's next in the service. Thanks, Arthur. So next is a client trial. After uh, approximately a year of development and testing, we are now currently in the process of trialing this service with our key clients. And this includes uh, interacting with the service in a production-like environment and evaluating the, the benefits of the service so that they can trust that the service is accurate and consistent. As the client provides feedback to us, we can seek out opportunities to make client-specific model optimizations. Are there specific operational nuances about that particular client that are required in order for us, in, from a modeling perspective, in order for us to refine the precision or recall? In addition, we will continue iterating on improving the service through various market cycles. For example, in our line of business, month ends, quarter ends, year ends are important times for our clients and the dynamics of trading change, therefore making it more difficult for us to predict settlement fails. But by identifying these different cycles, adjusting for the different training periods and looking at different model variables, we can find opportunities to improve the model during those time periods. And finally, as we predict outcomes, we can then identify opportunities to uh, have prescriptive analytics integrated into those predictions to help mitigate the fails, which will then allow for our clients to get more value out of this service. Now, finally, we'll hand it over to Sarthik to just talk about why Google Cloud. Why Google Cloud? So first, I want to talk about why cloud. If you think about this project, the two focus areas were around scalability and agility. The ability for us to run complex machine learning models requiring high infrastructure requirements. And if we had to do it on-prem, 
it would have taken us significant time as well as it would not have been cost efficient. So cloud was a natural solution for this project. Why Google Cloud? There are a couple of reasons here. One is Google BigQuery. BigQuery is highly scalable and extremely performant. Our developers and business analysts used to run queries on our on-prem databases of two to three days of transaction data. On Google Cloud BigQuery, they were able to run the same set of queries over two to three years at a transaction level. And the performance was very similar to two to three days on-prem. The second thing was about collaboration. This was a perfect opportunity for the Google engineers and the BNY Mellon engineers to work together. Both of us focused around data. How do we build strong data practices in terms of data ingestion, data storage, data indexing, as well as delivering data to our clients. It was fascinating to watch both the teams come together and solve a business problem. Thank you for watching this and hope this was helpful for yourselves.